All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so now we're going to a different course. Uh, BC, is it 206, Ministry of the Evangelist, Pastor and Teacher. So uh, I think the last few co sessions, uh, Pastor Selina said she has completed chapter one, right? Introduction of the fivefold ministry. Uh, we see, we learned in that chapter that uh, the fivefold ministry is something that God, the Lord Jesus, put in place. And uh, uh, there was a reason. He talked about the many reasons why the fivefold ministry has been put in the church. It was mainly to build the church and to equip us as believers. So now let's get into each aspect, right? Ministry of uh, the evangelist. So let's look at this topic. Now, like what we learned in the first years, we talked a lot about lifestyle evangelism, right? So we talked about how evan what is evangelism, why is evangelism important, all of that. But let us look at a different aspect. Let's look at the evangelist and Jesus as our example. Now, the Greek word evangel means to proclaim the good news. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Let's read that. Romans 1 16. Go ahead. Romans 1 16. Romans 1 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Yes. So Paul is writing, I think we've read this many, many times, but it says here that Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Right. So the primary responsibility of the evangelist is to proclaim the gospel. Look at Jesus. What did he do? How did the Lord Jesus fulfill the role of the evangelist? Was Jesus an evangelist? Did he have the title of an evangelist? Did they call him evangelist? No. But he did the work of an evangelist. Right? So how did the Lord Jesus function as an evangelist? First one. Look at, look at the different characteristics there, how his ministry was, um, uh, how he functioned during his ministry. First one, he was empowered. Now, Paul is writing, he said, he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because during that time, Paul was a well-known individual. He was commander of the temple guard, of Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees, uh, tribe of Benjamin, all kinds of titles he had, Roman citizen. And he's saying here, hey, he's writing to the Romans and he's saying, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. Because this gospel, what you call foolish, what you call as something man-made or something that is uh, against your gods, it is the power of God unto salvation. That means if you believe in this gospel, if you believe in this message of the gospel, it is the power of God to your salvation. So when the Lord Jesus walked in his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. That was interesting, right? The Son of God himself empowered by the Holy Spirit. There are plenty of verses. The Lord Jesus, when he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove. When he went out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he was there. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus was a human being. He was a man. Right? Sometimes we forget that. Can we do 40 days of fasting? We can. Can we do it on our own strength? Very difficult. But when we are empowered by the Spirit, we are able to. Right? The Lord Jesus 
was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Wherever he went, when he touched, cleansed people, cleansed the lepers, healed the sick, raised the dead, all that he did through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, I'm the son of God, so now you have to listen to me. No. He said, I'm doing all of this through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that when we follow, we have no excuse. We cannot say, you are Jesus, I'm, I'm just... We, were, we are also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at these few verses. Ma, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Maybe someone else can open to Acts 10, 38. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what Jesus is saying. He's quoting Isaiah and he's saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. He, the Holy Spirit has anointed me to do what I have to do. Cleanse the lepers, to heal the sick, to release those who are oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord has appointed me. Acts 10, 38, yes. 4.18, yeah. when it says uh, good news to the poor, it's referring to poor in spirit or poor materialistically or financially or how is it? How do we? No, it refers to poor in the spirit. Yeah. So even the Beatitudes, when he says, uh, he starts off with blessed are the poor in the spirit. He's not referring to a materialistic poorness. He's referring to uh, a poorness, a lack in understanding. Yeah, it's a spiritual aspect. Yeah, Acts 10 38. Anyone else would like to read? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and with power, mm -hmm. who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Mm -hmm. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth through the whole with the Holy Spirit. Look at that. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit to do whatever Jesus did. Right? Now, the word, uh, I like the word anointing. It's, uh, you know, it's like, it reminds me of dunamis, like, it reminds me of an explosive. Right? You, you take an explosive and you light it on, you know it's going to cause some damage. Once it blasts, that's what the anointing does. When God anoints us, there is something that is going to be released. The power of God will be released and there will be an effect, outward effect around us. Right? Let's read Hebrews 2, 2 to 4. Hebrews chapter 2, 2 to 4, yes. Oh, anyone for else if, can open Matthew 12, 28 as well. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transition and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect to neglect so great a salvation, which at the first begin to be spoken by the word by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Mm. God doing many signs, one God appointing us to do many signs and wonders through the Holy Spirit appointed to us. Right? Let's read Matthew 12, 28. But if I by the Spirit Louder, of... can you be a little I want to hear this. Bit but if I, by the uh, Spirit of God, cast upon de devils, this, that is the kingdom of God come upon you. Ah. So again, uh, Jesus is saying, if I am doing this through the Holy Spirit, that means the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what are we trying to say here? The ministry that Jesus did as an evangelist, 
was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Right? And so it's a very important lesson for us. When we are ministering to people, we are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, these are things that you may have heard many, 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 many times. You may say, Pastor, this is basic stuff. This everyone knows that we can't do ministry on our own. But you know what? When when you really get into ministry, when you really begin to do the work of the ministry, you will understand, you and I can will begin to understand the value and the 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 this, the need of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do it. Sometimes I remember early my early years, I thought, okay, I can do this. I can I felt I can do it. I, I remember when we uh, when we moved to Mangalore, I felt I can do it. I can do it. You know, uh, nothing. We just have to start some teams, do a couple of worship evenings every month. Do one worship. Evening, go out, do outreaches, do evangelism. People will come. And I had this thing of okay, I can do it. The church will grow, right? But at one point. I came to a place where I was physically completely drained out. I was just, I just felt like giving up. And, and I thought, what is this? I, I thought to myself, I just want to go back to Bangalore. And everything was like, nothing was working. I, I was physically drained out, mentally drained out. And I remember, you know, just going back to God and saying, God, what is happening? The Holy Spirit very clearly. Reminded me through the scriptures. I will never forget this. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by the Holy Spirit. And I remember that day. It was just a release. All of a sudden, I felt the burden is not mine anymore. For the church. It's, it's, not, my, it's not a burden that I'm going to carry. What I have to do is depend on the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to work. So all the while, maybe for about a year, I was only saying, I can do, I can do, I can do. Now there was a change. I said, God can do, God can do, God can do. Right? And then I began to see a sudden shift in the church. Really. People, people who, you know, with so much of hard work, I would spend four or five hours on the road evangelism and you know worship evenings all that is important but there was no fruit out of it for many for that entire there was no fruit nobody was turning up or something would happen but i remember after the season i began i continued to do the you know the outreaches and all of it but i was able to spend more time in prayer more time in god's word right just just focusing on god saying god even if it's two or three people bring them that their lives will let them be impacted. And so the, that shift alone, had it, there, was, there began a shift in the church. People started coming. And I've shared with you, right, like how one friend came in, and he said, I want to bring my friends. He brought some 15 people to church. I didn't do anything. So from one Sunday, we were 10. Next Sunday, we were 35. Every Sunday. Just the, just we it was a Saturday. We were about 10 people for that worship evening, 10 or 15 people that worship evening. One or two new people had come. In that, one of the guys said, Tomorrow I'll bring my friends and come to church. I said, Okay, bring maybe two, three people. He came with some 15 people to church. And those 15 people stayed for the entire four years that I was there. I was thinking to myself. I did so much on my own strength, going out and all that is important, but I depended on myself. I remember choosing the songs also. Will this song, will they like this song? The worship evening, no? Will they like it? What if they don't like the song? So better I change the song. So many times I've, you know, I, so I would really stress. I remember those days to make one song list for a worship evening, I would choose about eight songs. It took me two, three days to come up with eight songs. By the time those eight songs, I'll be fully stressed out. 
ah, finally eight songs have come. Now I have to practice those eight songs. So it was all like a burden. Now remember, for the Lord Jesus, when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, when he did ministry, it was not a burden. Ministry is not a burden that we carry. We must enjoy, right? And I remember that when that whole thing happened, right? People started coming in. Doors started just opening. Colleges. And um, people started inviting, you come here, do this, do that, do this. Um, of course, the church started growing. Families started coming. Couples, young couples, elderly couples, senior citizens. People just started coming. And there was just a freedom. I understood the value of being empowered by the Holy Spirit and then depending on your own gifts and talents. We need the gifts and talents. All right, We need that. But the empowering is what can make the gifts and talents more effective. See, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, but he did preach. He did stand and preach. He, he, when he, for example, he's preaching and teaching on the Beatitudes, he had to think of what he was saying. It was not like the Holy Spirit gave him the whole sermon. No, he had to sit, okay, he probably saw, okay, salt. You are the salt of the earth. But then he may have thought about light. You're the light of the earth. He was a man. He had to think through his sermon. right? It was not like Jesus went and just stood and started preaching. Not always. I'm sure he would have thought about what he's saying. So there's a line of knowing the, the, the place where, OK, this is where the Holy Spirit is. This is what he will do and what I must do as a leader. Right? So you get what I'm saying. So in everything, be empowered by the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus was. And, and then we'll begin to see the fruit. You will really see the fruit. Two, what was Jesus' audience? The audience was the poor, the lost sheep of Israel, and the sinners. Now, the poor, again, like how uh, you, you just asked, it is not only the poor physically or or you know see jesus chose matthew the tax collector he was rich he was a rich man as a tax collector that's why the pharisees and all came how come this guy is sitting with all these tax collectors and matthew had a big place that's why he had the banquet there right so it was the poor was not only materialistic but blessed are the poor in spirit those who were who were lost who didn't know anything about God, who was searching for God, that was his audience, the lost sheep of Israel, the sinners. Remember, Jesus is sitting with all of them, and he says, the Pharisees, say, why is this person sitting with all the sinners? Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need the doctor, it is the sick who need the doctor. So I have to obviously, if a healthy person goes to the hospital, what will you call him? Thank you. Hey, I'm healthy, I want to go to the hospital. Unless he likes hospital food. I did that once in my life. I was traveling somewhere and uh, I wanted to have my lunch. There was no place. I had to go into the hospital. I went straight to the canteen, ate and I came out. That's okay. But nobody will go to a doctor and say, Doctor, I'm feeling fine. This is just search if anything's wrong with me. The doctors want that kind of person. They'll say, you sit down, I'll tell you what all is wrong with you. Firstly, you're mentally unstable. <laughs> so nobody does that. The audience where Jesus spoke to was the poor, the, the sinners, the lost sheep of Israel, the sinners. And so our audience, when we minister to people, we minister to those who are lost. We can reach out to people, we, we, you know, those who are sinners. Right? Now, here's the thing. Also remember the context. Now, you see Jesus, he's saying, you are telling others what to do. You are not looking at the, you're looking at the speck of wood in others' eye when you're not looking the, at the log of wood in your own eye. So when we, as, uh, uh, as evangelists, or we are ministering to people, remember that we are not calling them sinners. Oh, you're a sinner. You have to change. That's why our words are very important. Look at Paul the Apostle. What does he say? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul doesn't say, while you were yet sinners, including himself, while we, 
we were all sinners christ died for us so even when we are you know again you learn all of this in homiletics as well even when we are ministering the choice of words the way we speak is very important right and and so god is calling our audience can be the lost the rich the poor anybody very important thirdly what is our message what is the message that jesus spoke first thing he spoke about was repentance mark chapter 1 verse 15 let's read that mark chapter 1 and verse 15 and saying that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe in the gospel mm. repent means to turn away from right to take a 180 degree turn that's what repent means now for example as a person who maybe is an alcoholic he begin he be, he receives the gospel he believes in jesus he says jesus thank you for you have forgiven you have forgiven all my sins and thank you for making me a new person he has accepted the lord as his personal savior now that's happened but maybe two weeks later he goes back to the same thing what he was doing but there is no conviction in his spirit then what has happened is there was no real repentance because repentance is turning 180 a complete turnaround right if you're heading north you have to head south that is repentance but i'm not saying see once we a person can become a believer yes there will be temptations it will be all the more because our flesh is still desiring you know to drink or to do whatever but even if i fall into sin there should be a conviction because the holy spirit will convict and say hey don't do this or what you've done is wrong go back to god if that is not there then i've not truly repented so here in this jesus said repent of your sins turn away from your sins don't go back to what you were doing right now the people in jerusalem at that time we must understand during jesus's time for many years they have been doing all these offerings and sacrifices and nothing makes sense to them it's like getting up on sunday morning having a drink getting ready becoming fresh going to church sitting through the entire service raising your hands during worship listen to the word go to the pastor ask him to pray for you go out of the church go straight to the bar have another drink go meet your friends have another few drinks there go back home have another few drinks sleep go back to work on monday monday to friday do your work saturday do your housework sunday morning go back to church or go back to have a first drink go back to church the same routine over and over and over again so the people when jesus is talking to them they were lost they have no idea what those sacrifices really mean so jesus is saying repent of your sins the things that you are doing is not right in the eyes of god that's the first thing secondly he says talks about forgiveness he's saying i have come he jesus himself says that you may know that the son of man has the authority to forgive sins he looks at the paralytic and he says take up your mat and walk and then the, all of them were saying who are you to forgive sins how can you say your sins are forgiven jesus says i you will know by the authority the, by the things that i'm doing that i have the authority to forgive sins and then he also says talks about forgiveness that was his message forgive one another learn to love one another forgive each other's sins right then he talks about the kingdom of god uh, and there are many many parables the kingdom parables that he talks about he says you know this is the kingdom of god this is what the kingdom of god is like 
you know it's like a seed you put it down on the ground it's going to grow it's going to multiply this is what you know he's talking about the kingdom of god and fourthly very important jesus in jesus's message was faith that's one of our favorite right all wherever jesus went he spoke faith he taught faith and he demonstrated faith and so this is a perfect example for us we can teach people faith and demonstrate faith and if we look at the way that jesus uh, you know demonstrated thought and demonstrated it was beautiful look think of this he tells the disciples what do you have five loaves of bread and two fish bring it to me he prays and he gives it back to the disciples did it multiply there so for example they brought five loaves of bread and two fish and gave it to jesus's hand what did jesus do the bible says he took and he prayed it he gave thanks he prayed and he said go and give it now did that uh, five loaves of bread and two fish multiply so much oh, it become so much that he carried it like this no he just gave it back to his disciples what a supernatural what, what, you know just think of it he gave it back to the disciples and he said go and give everyone how it just multiplied just probably they opened the baskets and the baskets were full full of bread and fish and they went and gave it he he taught faith he demonstrated that faith also he looked at peter and he said peter you want to walk are you sure peter says if you are truly the god if it's truly who you say you are you tell me and i will walk okay walk peter came out walking on the water right and so many places uh, jesus speaks teaches faith or speaks of faith and he demonstrates it that was his uh, i think one of the most important uh, aspects of his ministry what are the methods fourthly some of the methods that jesus used again we looked at it in the local church signs and wonders was the primary method let's read matthew chapter 9 35 and 36 and maybe someone else can open acts 2:22 Matthew chapter 9 35 and 36 Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people but when he saw the multitude he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd 35 and 36 then he said then he said to his disciples the harvest truly is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore pray the lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest yeah acts 222 as man of israel here here this world jesus of nazareth and man opened of god among you uh, by miracles and wonders and and things with god did by him it the midst of you has you also now yeah so we see here jesus himself doing signs wonders and we know it right jesus did so many signs wonders and miracles and we see that same pattern following in the early church in the book of acts doing signs wonders and miracles and so the methods jesus used that were signs wonders and miracles continued on with the early church and with those who were doing ministry in the early church fifthly he traveled he went around preaching the gospel he went to places he didn't just sit in one place the role of an evangelist is to travel to spread to go right so he went around preaching the gospel gospel there was motivation for him to go from place to place from cities to towns and villages so that he could preach jesus did not wait for people to come to him he went to people that is 
a responsibility of the evangelist. We go to people and we minister to people. Sixthly, sixth one, challenges. Just like how you and I will face challenges, Jesus faced his own set of challenges. He faced unbelief. Mark chapter 6, 5 and 6. People, let's read that. People in some places, in some cities and towns, did not believe in Jesus. They did not believe in the miracles that he did, nor did they believe that he can do the miracles. Now, this is you need a you know you need a higher grace to walk in this kind of unbelief because you're seeing the miracles you know that you know peter jesus has walked on water healed the lepers cleansed the uh, lepers and healed the sick you, you know it but still people didn't believe let's read that verse mark 6 5 and 6 um, but he said to them let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Mark 6, is that? Mark 6. Mark 6, 5 and 6. Okay. Now he could do no mighty work there, except uh, that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Mm. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Mm. Then mm. he went about the villages in a circuit teaching look at that verse jesus could not do much in that place because of their unbelief one and two jesus marveled at their unbelief that means jesus himself was surprised how are these people how are they with so much unbelief how is it possible? They're seeing the miracles. They know the miracles. Still, they have so much unbelief. Jesus marveled at them. So it was like, uh, like for example, it was like, you know, there were people who were, uh, you know, blind. They received their sight. But when he came to this town, the, you know, people did not believe that he can heal the blind. The blind can see or the deaf can hear or the paralyzed can rise up and walk. They've heard it in that town. But in this town, they did not believe. And he, Jesus himself marveled. Why are they in such unbelief? So now remember this. You and I may be going to places, to new territory, to new people. Some people may say, may believe. Like the people in Judea, they, they just believed everything Jesus said. Samaria, they saw a lot of miracles. right? They didn't care. But in his own city, his brother said, you're mad. You better you go and uh, go to the feast. You go show yourself there, right? And here, as as believers, when we go out, we will encounter these kind of people. Some who believe, some who will have faith, some who will not have any faith. Right? So we must learn how to handle these kind of people, these kind of situations. Jesus faced these challenges. We may also be able to face it. And he also encountered demonic encounters. Many places there were demonic encounters. Remember the woman who had a daughter who was convulsing every time. The man also in the book of Mark who had a son who was, uh, you know, was possessed, and the spirit would throw him into the fire or into uh, the waters, uh, and he comes and says. I showed him to the disciples, but the disciples could not, you know, heal him. And Jesus says, "Bring him to me." Right. So there were demonic encounters uh, that Jesus also faced, but he was able to overcome those demonic encounters through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And one another important or a critical thing that he faced was opposition from religious leaders. There were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were leaders there who were just against Jesus of Nazareth. You know, if you read the Gospels, you know, go back and read it intently. Don't read it in a way that, you know, okay, I finished Matthew. Read it intently. Some of the verses you feel, how did I miss this? In some places, in one, in one passage, I'm, I, I'm not sure of the chapter and the verse, but in some places, you know, they tried to seize him, but they could not. Did you ever think of it? 
the first thing he opens Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is up, uh, anointed me. And then he closed this, the scroll and he says, today this word is fulfilled. If you read towards the end, they took him to the cliff to throw him off the cliff. What did Jesus do? The verse there says, Jesus walked away from there. For they could not lay a hand on him. Imagine, 100 people versus 1. They could not lay a hand on him. All they needed to do is two people hold his hand, two people hold his leg and throw him off. They could not. It was not his time. Remember the other time when he's in the temple and they says, you destroy this temple after four days, I'll rebuild it. What are you talking about? You're not when old enough. No, before Abraham was, I am. What are you talking about? What What is this? You're only not when you're only 30 years old or not when our age and you're saying I, before Abraham was, I am. So the Bible says they went to seize him, but they could not touch him. So many places. There was oppositions. There were the Pharisees. They were behind him. There was one place where uh, he's in Judea and he says, I have to go to Jerusalem. And very interestingly, in the Feast of the Tabernacles, all these high priests, they're all sitting and waiting. Think of this. They're all sitting and waiting. Where is this Jesus guy? You see, has he come? They're talking among themselves. They're waiting to see him. He's become the point of attraction there. They, they don't know what to do, whether to kill him or whether to listen to him. But they knew there was something about this guy. So they're all discussing. The Pharisees, where is he? Has he come today? They're talking about it. Has he come? Because they, they could not see him. Then in, in Matthew 24, he says that on the last day of the feast, Jesus goes up to the temple and he begins to speak. So there will be oppositions, but there will be times when God will help you to overcome those oppositions. There are times when God will just tell you, stay quiet. Don't do anything now. But there are times God will say, stand up and do what I'm telling you to do because I am with you. Do you think that that's why the Bible says, no, like a sheep that was taken to the slaughter. If Jesus wanted, he could have walked out of that place. He could have just put his hand on himself and healed his own body after the scourges. He could have told chains, he could have just done this, the chains would have broken. He could have just walked out of the Romans, um, you know, uh, authority for all those. Well, you know, the scourging and the beating, he could have just walked out of there. Just simply walked out. But he chose not to. Right? He could have, even on the cross, he could have said, get on. He could have got down. He could have done it, but he did it. He didn't do it for us. Right? It was he gave his life for us. It was not taken from him. He gave his life. That's a powerful thing. So, there will be oppositions, there will be people you know, opposing us, especially in a season that we are in now, in our nation of India. There will be oppositions, there will be oppositions greater, bigger, higher. And when we're coming towards the end times, you will see oppositions that, that will really cause us fear. Right? Uh, but that's how Jesus was able to oppose or stand against those oppositions, the Holy Spirit will empower us to go against those oppositions. Seventh, he had support. He sent others to reproduce. Remember in Luke chapter 9, 1 and 2. Let's read that. Luke 9, 1 and 2. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and cured diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Look at this. Jesus calls his 12 disciples and says, Okay, now whatever you have seen me doing, you will do. I have given you the authority. You go, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, raise the dead. Freely you have received, freely you give. So Jesus used the people that he had uh, as a support team. He used them. He sent them to reproduce, to go and reach out. People gave financially 
to the ministry. Luke chapter 8, 1 through 3. Let's read that. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad uh, tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil Luke? spirits. Is that Luke? Luke, Luke 8. 8, 1, 2, 3? Yes. Okay, go ahead. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Jonah, the wife of Chusa, uh, Herodos, steward, and Susanna, and many authors who provided for him from their substance. Yeah, many of them who provided for him. So there were many people who gave into the ministry of Jesus. Right. So here we see in this chapter, the evangelist, Jesus set an example. He was able to be empowered by the Spirit. We are to be empowered by the Spirit. The audience, he spoke to everyone. The poor, the rich, the lost, that was his audience. And we are to also minister to everyone. The message, repentance, forgiveness. He spoke about the kingdom of God. He spoke about faith. And doesn't mean that we have to only do these four. We have plenty to speak about, right? So you can add to that as believers. We have so much. The New Testament has so much that we can speak of, right? Uh, so we can add to that methods, signs, wonders, and miracles, uh, that which continued on to the early church. And right now, we can depend on the Holy Spirit for signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, we also preach the word in authority, preach the word in power. Um, then Jesus traveled. He went to places. If we get opportunities, we go about, we travel, we minister from place to place. There are challenges that Jesus faced. We will also be able to, we will face these certain challenges. But remember that the Holy Spirit in us is greater than he that is in the world. Uh, people supported him, supported Jesus, not only through, uh, through people, but also materialistically. So when you, if God is calling you to this kind of ministry, uh, God will send people. God will send finances. God will send material need. Right? Don't worry about that. Right? Uh, uh, you know, the, the life of an evangelist is a life of faith. Right? Uh, and I've met many evangelists, and, uh, and I've heard and I've sp spoken to them, heard a lot of stories and how you know, they have started small, but the hand of God, just supernaturally providing for them. Remember this one story which I I, I met one evangelist in uh, in North India, and he was sharing with me. He said God called him to full time ministry, and then he was, uh, you know, going about you know just ministering to people. And he had two children, and this one time he he was he was going through a very difficult financial uh, need. There was no food at home. Uh, you know, the children were in school, but their fees weren't paid. And he was really crying out to God and saying, God, your word says you will not see my children forsaken and begging for bread. So, Lord, I trust you. And, and he was sharing the story with me. Uh, you know, as an evangelist, people would just probably give him a little bit of an offering and all of that. But God, in his mercy, somebody had told, uh, you know, the long story short, uh, so a believer who he knew, this evangelist knew, uh, he had spoken to somebody overseas and said, you know, I know this evangelist. He's doing a good work ministering to people from other faiths. And so that person overseas, I think it was the, in America, he said, you know, I've been praying that God has told me to support somebody in India uh, and just support their ministry. And not for, I don't want to give this seed to in, in America, but I want to sow the seed in India. So I want to support this person. So they sent a certain amount, and every year, every sorry, every month, he would get this support. With this support, he was able to pay the fees, look after his household, and you know, just clear off things that was there in his life. And I'm not saying this will happen always, 
But what I'm saying is God is a God who knows our needs, right? Uh, so don't be worried about how will God provide for me? Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They don't store up in barns. They don't store up. But I will. I provide for them. Same way, you are my children. Will I not provide for you? I know what you need. I know when you need it. So if there is, if there's this feeling of, you know, how will I look after my family if I step into full time? Minute? Of course, God's call should be there. But if that is your feeling, if you feel that if I become an evangelist, where will be be my source of income? Don't worry about all of that. God will provide. Right. But again, very important. We need to be wise how we make our decisions. Right? And you should be sure that God is calling you for this kind of a calling. And if you're sure about it, know that God will provide your needs, every need. Right? You don't have to worry about it. So we must model ourselves after the life of Jesus Christ. Right? The way he did ministry, we model ourselves after that. Right? So we will stop here. Uh, next class, we'll pick up from... Uh, the evangelist in the early church. Uh, we look at how the evangelism was done in the early church. And then we can move on from there. Right. Shall we uh, just say a word of prayer even as we close? Right. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for these three hours where we could just get together and learn your word. Lord, we learned about the local church. We learned about the ministry of the evangelist to God. And Lord, we just pray, God, that no matter what you have called us to do, that we would be faithful, give us the grace, give us the wisdom, help us to walk in faith, Lord. And I pray for each and every student of God here in person and online. I pray, God, that you minister to their spirit of God, minister to their hearts of God, every plan, every purpose that you have for them, Lord. Lord, reveal and fulfill it in their lives, of God. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity to study and learn your word, of God. I pray, Lord, that your word will continue to touch and mold our lives, of God, build us and strengthen us into what you want us to be, Lord. We commit this rest of the day into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. See you soon.